Welcome back, everyone, to part two of our look at Mr. Beat's video on every president's biggest mistake. If you didn't see part one of my reaction, which covers the presidents up through Grover Cleveland, there is a link in the description that will take you back to that first part. I'd highly recommend you checking that out first. Don't have to, though. Uh, and just a little heads up on this one. Uh, Mr. Beat's original video, he and I were talking about this yesterday after I did part one of the reaction, actually got age-restricted which means a lot of people don't even see it, which means there was something in his content and must be in part two because my reaction didn't get age restricted. They got him age restricted and I've been given a heads up that it might be something to do with one of the final couple of presidents that he covered. So there's a possibility I may end up having to edit this video. Uh, and at the end, if there's stuff missing in the middle, that was why, because it got age restricted and I want to avoid that. So the easiest way to do that would just be to cut out the offending parts. So we're gonna see what happens, but let's go ahead and dive into part two. Benjamin Harrison. Harrison's biggest mistake also hurt Native Americans. And I'm not talking about his proclamation opening up Indian territory to American settlement. I'm talking about the fact that under his authority, the U.S. Army murdered around 146 Sioux on December 29th, 1890 on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Today we call call this the Wounded Knee Massacre. And not only did Harrison approve of it, but he gave out medals of honor to 20 of the American soldiers guilty of the massacre. Jeez, dude. So yeah, let's talk about that for a second because the unit that perpetrated what we call the Wounded Knee Massacre uh, was the 7th Cavalry. It was the same 7th Cavalry that, what, a decade and a half earlier had a large portion of itself wiped out at Little Bighorn. Uh, so kind of a full circle moment there where they're massacring a lot of women and children. There were men too, but uh, yeah, there's no getting around that. And uh, it would, on the surface, the argument could be, well, he was president. He wasn't there. He didn't make the decision in the moment that led to that. But how he dealt with it afterwards shows that he was okay with it, like he said. So you'd, because of how he dealt with it and because of all the medals of honor that were given and that's very controversial to this day you do have to pin that on him william mckinley mckinley's biggest mistake was the philippine american war a war so messed up that you wouldn't believe what happened in it if i told you 20 times it was an unjust war from the very start the filipinos had just gained independence from spain and mckinley now wanted the united states to control them of course they resisted and between 1899 and 1902 perhaps as many as 1 million Filipino civilians died because of it. American forces burned villages, threw Filipinos into concentration camps, and tortured Filipinos who were suspected of rebelling against Americans. There's other horrible stuff American troops did, but I won't go into detail in case there are any kids watching. This war is one of the ugliest parts of American history, and McKinley was responsible for it. And listen, I'm a McKinley guy, uh, if for no other reason than he's our local president. My wife and uh, three of my four grandparents grew up in Niles, Ohio, which is McKinley's hometown. My great-great-great-uncle built the house McKinley was born in. My wife went to Niles McKinley High School. Um, so we tend to look pretty favorably out of our biased opinion toward McKinley, but there's no getting around this. Uh, he's absolutely right. The Philippine-American War is one of the darkest chapters in our history. Uh, a lot of it <clears throat> perpetrated by a guy that we'll hear a lot more about in the next decade or two, John J. Pershing, uh, who was a part of all of that. Theodore Roosevelt. As much as I talk trash about Teddy's crappy foreign policy, I give him mad props for it improving throughout his presidency. He was a man who changed his mind when learning new information, after all. True. However, one thing still stands out as a pretty big mistake during his presidency. The Brownsville Affair. In Brownsville, Texas, in August 1906, after someone killed a white bartender and injured a white 
police officer, the town's residents all decided to blame all the members of the African American 25th Infantry Regiment. Even though there was no evidence they actually did it, well, Roosevelt thought they were guilty, ordering 167 of the 25th Infantry Regiment's soldiers dishonorably discharged. In other words, Teddy didn't allow them to have due process of the law, they were guilty until proven innocent. By the way, the army found them innocent in 1972. By then, only two of them were still alive. Yeah, um, and I should point out, and I'm not trying to make light of this particular situation, because it, it is definitely a dark mark on Theodore Roosevelt, who actually had a pretty decent uh, record when it came to his relations with the African-American community outside of this kind of stuff. Um, first got to have dinner with a black person in the White House, for example. Um, but yeah, uh, listen, let's not gloss over the fact that just because we think Teddy Roosevelt's a good president and he's one of our greatest presidents, that, that many was perfect. But I should point out that with some of these presidents, you notice we are focusing on a very specific single issue that affected a small number of people. Now, for those for that small number of people, it's a big, big deal. You know, the Wounded Knee Massacre is a big, big deal. The murder of people, even if it was just hundreds and not thousands or tens of thousands, still horrible and should not have happened. The discharge of these men from the army should not have happened. But some of these presidents we're talking about made decisions that affected tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of people like the one we talked about with McKinley a minute ago. So so there is a bit of perspective there in terms of the, the level of things. It doesn't make it any better. William Howard Taft. Taft's biggest mistake was signing the Payne Aldrich Tariff Act, a law that mostly raised tariffs and was so controversial that it deeply split the Republican Party. Taft himself was quite proud of the new law, later calling it, quote, the, the best, best tariff bill the Republican Party ever passed. While it did lower tariffs on some items, it raised it on others and ultimately just frustrated everyone. It also made the Philippines heavily dependent Dependent on the United States. Okay, so um, we all know Mr. Beat, how he feels on tariffs. This is right at the point where we're going to see the federal government uh, pass a uh, law that will allow well, a constitutional amendment and then a law to enforce that amendment that's going to allow for a national income tax. Uh, and the federal government is going to start to get to, get away from tariffs as their main source of revenue. Uh, so we're gonna. That's why you don't see tariffs talked about as a major political issue in the 20th century the way you did in the 19th century. Um, and with that in mind, here we go. Woodrow Wilson. Wilson's biggest mistake. Wilson. Yes, yes. <laughs> Joe. He had many mistakes, but I think his biggest mistake was signing the. Espionage and Sedition There's Act. so many choices. Passed after the United States entered World War I, the Espionage Act made it illegal to interfere in the war effort in any way. The Sedition Act made it a crime to say, quote, disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive stuff about the American government, armed forces, or even its flag. According to historian Paul Averick, as many as 1,000 people went to prison as as a result of the Espionage and Sedition Acts signed by Wilson. Some of them got sentences up to 20 years in prison. Again, in my view, these are laws that strongly went against the First Amendment. So interesting that that particular version of the Alien and Sedition Acts from 100 years before um, affects like a thousand people. The Alien and Sedition Acts, I think under John Adams, it was like less than two dozen people that were affected by that. Um, definitely bad. I'm not discounting that this was bad. I probably would lean much more heavily on how Wilson dealt with race relations in terms of basically freezing black people out of federal government jobs. Um, I feel like that affected a lot more people. I feel like that had a much more lasting impact. Uh, most of these laws that Wilson had were basically during wartime, which for the U.S. was about a year and a half. 
that the U.S. was a part of World War I. Uh, once it, they declared war in April 1917, uh, armistice November 1918. Um, I, I feel like his impact on uh, African Americans when it comes to their jobs in the federal government and a lot of other things he did was much more lasting and much more devastating to more people. Warren Harding. The 1920s were not good in terms of xenophobia and anti-immigrant legislation in general, True. and Harding definitely played a role in that. His biggest mistake was signing the Emergency Quota Act, a law restricting immigration from certain countries that were, quote, undesirable. In reality, it was just meant to restrict immigrants coming from Eastern and Southern Europe. That said, I also have two dishonorable mentions for Harding. He signed the crappy for Nima Cumber. All right, time out. We're going to do dishonorable mentions for Harding, but we couldn't have done that for Wilson. Come on. Anyway. For tariff. Hey, you know how I feel about tariffs. And the Revenue Act of 1921, which was really just a law super wealthy people wanted passed since they didn't like paying taxes. All right, so um, again, can't disagree with that. Harding is the reason. Harding was the last in a string of a bunch of Ohio presidents that we had, and there's a reason we haven't had one since. It's because Harding was that bad. Um, Calvin Coolidge. Speaking of crappy immigration laws, Coolidge's biggest mistake was signing the Immigration Act of 1924, which expanded xenophobia to Asia. It heavily restricted immigration from Asia. It's even also called the Asian Exclusion Act, by the way. Together with the Emergency Quota Act, the Immigration Act of 1924 favored immigrants from Northern and Western Europe, for some reason. I guess it was because their skin color tended to be lighter. Anyway, the xenophobic immigration system solidified by this law stayed in place until the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965. Immigrants have historically made the United States very strong as a country. In fact, we'd probably be screwed without them. And Coolidge's immigration law essentially shut the door on most immigrants. So this is a time, I, I want to actually pull some stats up on this before I address it. Um, heavy immigration, late 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, and I want to look at some of the numbers of where those folks are coming from and, and how many there were. So let's take a look at this first of all, because this shows you where it's at. And this is the decade immediately preceding uh, the First World War. So uh, it peaks at 8 million immigrants who come between 1900 and 1909. Uh, 6 million, 1910 to 1919. Uh, and then it drops dramatically uh, in the aftermath of those couple of laws uh, that restrict pretty heavily. And interesting to note that that kind of corresponds with a time when uh, Jews in particular start getting heavily persecuted in places like Russia, Eastern Europe in general. Um, and a lot of those folks and gypsies and others that might be like looking for a better life suddenly have to look at other places besides the United States because of the restrictions on Eastern European immigration. Here's another way to look at it. And this is U.S. immigrant population as a share of the population. Uh, and it was pretty steady from post-Civil War when there was a big boom of like um, British immigration, for example, to the U.S., um, it's pretty steady at around 14, 15% of the population at any given time uh, is immigrant. Uh, after 1920, that's when you start to see that number decline dramatically until 70, which is when he just talked about Johnson signing that bill in 1965. And so now we start to see that go back up and it's back up to the levels it had always been uh, 100 years ago, which is about 13, 14% of the population. The difference is, of course, that the number of immigrants has dramatically increased because the total population has dramatically increased. And in 1900, this is a pretty cool statistic, this shows the foreign-born population of the United States by country of origin. And we can see where most people are coming from. Where were they born? Because in the, in the census, you have to report where you were born. And so the people who were not born in the United States uh, in 1900, by far, we're looking at Germany. 2.7 million uh, were born in Germany. Next after that, you've got Ireland with 1.6 million. 
Uh, you've got Canada with 1.2 million. Uh, so then the numbers after that go down. Uh, you've got 800,000 from England. Um, we've probably got a decent number, 200 some thousand from Scotland, 400,000 from Russia, 400,000 from Poland, 300,000 from Norway. Um, I don't see any other really big numbers there. 276,000 from Austria, uh, 500,000 from Sweden. So the number of immigrants, um, and, and maybe it goes up in the decade or two after that, but the number of immigrants from the places that were being excluded is actually pretty low at that point. So none of that really means a lot. I just thought it was interesting to kind of take a tangent there and look at some of the immigration stats. Herbert Hoover. Oh boy. The Great Depression. No, we can't blame the entire depression no, on can't. Hoover, but he did make it worse. Hoover's biggest mistake was the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act, which was supposed to encourage people to buy American-made stuff by placing tariffs and thus increasing the cost of imported stuff. Instead, it led to trading partners retaliating by raising their tariff yep. rates and ultimately froze international trade, causing companies' sales to drop everywhere. In fact, this one law dramatically made the Great Depression worse. Soon after Hoover signed signed it, the banks began to fail. By the end of 1931, nearly 2,300 banks had failed and $1.7 billion in deposits were lost. Yeah, so um, there are times when events happen that we can't blame on the people in charge. But what you can do, as he said there, is blame them for how they responded, right? Uh, could Hoover have prevented the Great Depression? I'm not sure that he could have. Could he have handled it better? Absolutely. Um, so we, we have to be sober in our judgment in saying, well, just because he was president, we can't blame him for the fact that it happened on his watch. But what did you do after? Did you make the right choices? And he was trying to help it, trying to make it better. It backfired. Franklin Roosevelt. FDR's biggest mistake was forcing more than 125,000 Japanese Americans to live in concentration camps, completely stripping them of their freedoms, despite no evidence that any of them were conspiring to help Japan in World War II. If you want to learn more about it, I have a video here you can check out, and another video about it here. Then again, by this point, you're probably depressed and have lost all faith in humanity so maybe you don't want to learn more about this stuff yeah can't argue with that i mean depending on your politics you could look at some of his new deal policies and argue whether or not they were good for the country and whether or not they hurt a lot of people uh, but he's absolutely right and i think we all agree on the internment camps for japanese americans which incidentally didn't really inter too many Japanese Americans in Hawaii, which you would think would be the place they were worried about it the most. But in Hawaii, they had martial law, and so it was not necessarily viewed as necessary. So this is mostly happening on the West Coast. Meanwhile, Japanese Americans are making up one of the best combat units in the entire Second World War. One of the most highly decorated, one of the uh, best performing, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, which fights in Europe and just... Uh, does incredible things for America while America is interning people who look like them. So, Harry Truman. Truman's biggest mistake was the Cold War. Wait, the entire Cold War? Well, kind of, yeah. He escalated tensions that contributed to the Cold War happening in the first place. For starters, his foreign policy, famously known as the Truman Doctrine, called for military interventions all over the world in the name of, quote, support for democracies against authoritarian threats. Say, did that mean at home, too? Anyway, whether it was getting the United States involved in the Korean War, giving military and economic aid to countries to fight governments friendly to the Soviet Union, quickly expanding the development of nuclear weapons, or destroying any chance of diplomacy with Soviet leaders, Truman's actions all played a big role, increasing tensions between the two countries. Don't get me wrong, I'd blame the Soviet Union's government just as much for causing the Cold War. They were far from innocent, but Truman's actions definitely played a key role as well. I always cut Truman some slack, though. He was president during a tremendously difficult time in history. 
Not sure how much I agree with Matt on this one. Um, I, I wonder how it would have been different. Now, granted, yes, you can point to the Truman Doctrine. You can point to Truman's policies uh, and see the line from there to Korea, Vietnam, and those sorts of things. But I'm not entirely sure any other president would have done it any differently. I feel like that's kind of the way it would have been done by just about anybody in his situation. Um you know, even during the Second World War, before Truman's even president, uh, folks like Churchill and uh, Roosevelt are thinking along these lines that this is going to be the thing they're going to have to deal with. Uh, and, you know, Stalin's out of there in 1953, so maybe things could have been better uh, under Eisenhower's administration, but he kind of continued that policy. So I guess if you're to make this argument, you might say, well, if Truman hadn't escalated things, well, maybe then when Stalin dies in the early 50s, maybe then dealing with guys like Khrushchev would have gone better. I don't know. Um, I don't feel real strongly on this one, though. Dwight Eisenhower. Look, as you may already know, I like but his presidency was also not without mistakes. None Particularly were. his reckless roundup of undocumented Mexican immigrants along the southern border and him signing Executive Order 10450, which contributed to the Lavender Scare. However, I think Ike's biggest mistake was allowing the CIA to help overthrow the democratically elected Prime Minister Mohammed Mossadegh in favor of the Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, yep. aka Operation Ajax. It was the first time the CIA CIA directly orchestrated a coup of a democratically elected government, and it later led to a more radical government getting in there after the Iranian Revolution, which itself then led to the Iran hostage crisis. The bottom line is, Iranians would never forget the American government's involvement in overthrowing their popular leader. Even today, the governments of Iran and the United States have a poor relationship. And it all goes back to 1953 and Operation Ajax. 100% agree. I'm not even going to add anything to that. He's 100% right. Uh, that is one of the biggest foreign policy mistakes we've made in the last 100 years. John F. Kennedy. JFK's biggest mistake was the Bay of Pigs invasion, yep. which was a failed military operation in which Cuban exiles landed in Cuba in order to attempt to overthrow Cuba's communist government led by Fidel Castro. Most historians acknowledge the invasion as one of the biggest foreign policy failures in American history. It made Castro even more of a hero and increased Cold War tensions with the Soviet Soviet Union. Not only that, it made Cuba a closer ally of the Soviet Union, setting the stage for the Cuban Missile Crisis the very next year. Can't argue with any of that, and you'll notice a theme here, right? Some missteps by the U.S. and how they're dealing with the perceived communist threat. And that's going to continue through the 60s as well. Lyndon Johnson. LBJ's biggest mistake was the escalation of troops in the Vietnam War. Yep. Not only do most historians view the war as a costly disaster, LBJ's justification for dramatically increasing troop levels there to fight it was partially based on a straight up lie. Congress agreed to escalate troops there after the two attacks that together Gulf became known as the Gulf of Tonkin incident. As it turns out, American soldiers provoked the first attack and the second attack never happened. well that never happened LBJ in his administration completely lied about it so ultimately tens of thousands of American troops ended up dying based on this lie yeah again can't argue with any of that he's a hundred percent right um, major mistakes that cost a lot of lives and not just the ten not the just the, what, 50, 60,000 American lives, but probably well over a million lives in Vietnam as well. Richard Nixon. You might be thinking that Watergate was Nixon's biggest mistake, yeah. or perhaps his secret bombing of Cambodia and Laos, as revealed in the Pentagon Papers. But I'd argue him starting the war on drugs was his biggest mistake. It was more than just words. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage 
a new all-out offensive. Nixon created the Office of Drug Abuse Law Enforcement, which eventually morphed into the Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA, who mostly went after non-violent drug offenders. Incarceration rates have skyrocketed ever since, with people of color disproportionately being arrested and convicted with harsher sentences than other groups, even though everybody uses drugs at the same rate. In fact, many argue Nixon's war on drugs was mostly racially motivated. Nixon signed the Controlled Substances Act, which criminalized drug abuse and said, without any evidence whatsoever, that marijuana and psilocybin were just as dangerous as heroin and more dangerous than cocaine. Ever since, people who have needed medical treatment have instead been sent to prison with violent offenders. According to some estimates, the United States has spent more than $1 trillion dollars fighting the war on drugs. Mm. And the drugs won the war. By the way, drug use today is arguably as common as ever. Gerald Ford. Ford wasn't president long enough to do Pardoning much Nixon. damage, but I'd argue his biggest mistake was his support of the brutal Indonesian dictator Suharto and his invasion of East Timor from 1975 to 1976. It led to tens of thousands of civilians dying, and Ford gave Suharto the weapons that led to those deaths. Yeah, so I would argue that, politically speaking, his biggest mistake was pardoning Nixon. I understand why he did it, but but yeah, if the standard that we're using, and I think Matt's being consistent here, is um, the decision that had the negative impact on the most people, then obviously the main pers- the main people that uh, the pardon had a negative impact on were the Republicans who were running for office. So. Jimmy Carter. This one is easy, and Carter himself even later admitted that this was a big mistake on his part. How he handled the yeah. Iran hostage crisis. That was the defining Which thing I have a video presidency. about, of course. I'm always making videos and stuff. No matter what Carter seemed to do, whether it be economic pressure, diplomacy, or even sending in the military to try to rescue them, things just didn't go right yeah. to rescue those 63 American hostages. Ronald. Yeah, again, I can't argue with that. And I, um, it was one of those things that really hurt Jimmy Carter. Uh, and of course, especially the fact that the day Ronald Reagan gets into office, they get released. Um, it just it made him look really bad, even though it might not necessarily have all been his fault. Ronald Reagan. Simply put, Reagan's biggest mistake might be something named after him. Reaganomics. Reaganomics. Yeah. Reaganomics is basically the economic policies popularized and associated with Reagan, but they're nothing new. You know, stuff like deregulation, tightening the money supply to fight inflation, and reducing the federal income tax and capital gains taxes. And to be honest, I'm personally a fan of all that stuff, at least to a certain extent. However, Reaganomics took all that to the extreme, and many economists say that his policies dramatically reduced economic mobility, meaning ever since it's been much more difficult for Americans to get out of poverty. Economists also argue Reaganomics has led to a widening income gap. The rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, basically. It also has definitely led to a general trend of the national debt spiraling out of control. Yeah, um, listen, I'm not... Uh in any way, shape, or form. I mentioned this in the last episode, an expert on economic policy and its impact on things, so I really don't feel qualified to judge one way or the other. But like he said, a lot of uh, economists say that, so I'm not in any position to disagree with that. We're getting into the territory where things might get edited out, so just a heads up on that. George H.W. Bush. Although a dishonorable mention ought to go to Operation Just Cause, which was when the United States invaded Panama to overthrow their leader, Manuel Noriega. I think Bush Sr.'s biggest mistake was pardoning six of the convicted criminals associated with the Iran-Contra affair. Simply put, I think it greatly undermines the idea that no person is above the law. And yes, I have a video about that too, sorry. All this homework for you. Bill Clinton. 
Clinton usually gets remembered for his personal scandals, especially the Monica Lewinsky scandal that ultimately led to him being impeached, but I think some of the laws he signed were much more damaging for the country. Three laws stand out to me in particular as doing way more harm than good. The Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, aka the 1994 Crime Bill, the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act, and the Telecommunications Act of 1996. While the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act had good aspects, like decreasing unemployment, saving the federal government money, and decentralizing welfare management, it completely ignored existing systemic problems and has arguably led to even more poverty among people of color and more non-violent drug offenders having a more difficult time after they get out of prison. The Telecommunications Act of 1996 caused a small number of giant corporations to control nearly all media, making it much more difficult these days for independent musicians, filmmakers, and artists to have their stuff discovered. But Clinton's biggest mistake was signing the 1994 Crime Bill, which gave money to states to build new prisons and hire new police officers, but also led to much stricter prison sentences overall. Because of that law, tens of thousands of people got far more harsh punishments than they deserved. And just like the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act, the 1994 Crime Bill made systemic racism much worse. People of color got arrested more than whites and got harsher sentences than whites for the exact same crimes. By the way, Clinton himself has admitted that signing this law was his biggest mistake. Yeah, I would agree on the crime bill. Uh, I would say this about the telecommunications one where he said that it made it, made, it's made it harder than ever today for independent folks to get this stuff. That may have been true for a while, but I feel like we are living in the best time for people uh, who are independent and trying to create on their own, be successful. Look at YouTube. Look at the power of YouTube uh, and look at what it has made possible. Uh, for folks like myself, like Mr. Beat, like Mr. Beast, who's got 130 million subscribers now and doing incredible things. And he's just some kid that, you know, a decade ago probably would have been destined for a life that might have been meaningful, but none of us would have ever heard of him. Um, so I feel like that's not the case anymore. George W. Bush. This is another easy one. Iraq. Bush Jr.'s biggest mistake was Operation Iraqi Freedom. Can I just say one thing about this? And I understand that we are getting into territory now where recency bias definitely has an impact and people's emotions are going to be much stronger. So please keep it civil in the comment section, first of all. Uh, it's a minor squibble that I have with things here, but I don't like it when... I feel like calling him Bush Jr. is a condescending thing intended to make him look like the uh, like a weakling and a you know minor less important person. He's not Bush Jr. Okay, he's he's got a different name. He's not George Bush Jr. So I feel like like we don't call Theodore Roosevelt Teddy Jr. ever. So I feel like it's done in a derogatory way, and I think it's disrespectful. Bush's invasion of Iraq in 2003 was mostly a huge failure based on lies. The Iraq War and War in Iraq later on both devastated the country, leading to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of innocent people and the loss of tens of billions of dollars due to damage, and Bush and his administration were mostly to blame for it. Yeah, can't argue with any of that. Barack Obama. Obama's biggest mistake was the expansion and normalization of the use of armed drones. He dramatically increased drone warfare, targeting suspected terrorists in multiple countries, often ignoring the sovereignty of those countries. And he dropped many of these bombs on innocent civilians. In fact, as much as more than 15% of the casualties were civilians. He normalized the use of drone warfare, which I think frankly, is pretty messed up. Related to this, Obama killed this 16-year-old American citizen with a drone strike. Now, it may have been an accident, but geez, man, the kid didn't do anything wrong. That was murder. I don't know what my choice would be for Obama. I have a few ideas, but um, I'm not entirely sure I agree with this one because I feel like the alternative 
to those drone strikes. Um, first of all, drone strikes, 15% being civilians, that's that's horrible, right? I mean, 15% is, is 15% too many. But I think, what's the alternative? We send troops in, and then I think a lot more people get killed, and probably a lot more civilians end up getting killed, and certainly a lot more American soldiers. I think, given the choices and the, the options he had, it was probably the best one. I'm not entirely sure I agree with that. Donald Trump. Oh, Trump loved drone warfare too. He possibly killed even more civilians than Obama did, but we won't know for a really long time. If that's true or not, since he kept all that information secret. It's classified, baby. But what's not secret is his blatant attempts to overturn the legitimate presidential election of 2020. After he lost the election, he repeatedly lied about there being widespread voter fraud, and in the process, riled up his devoted followers, creating political chaos across the country that culminated with the January 6th United States Capitol attack. By undermining the 2020 election, he put our entire electoral system in jeopardy. Even today, tens of millions of Americans still believe there was widespread voter fraud, and it's only mostly because Trump insisted there was. It's certainly not because of their so-called evidence. I've looked very closely at this so-called evidence, and it's crap. I'm sorry. There's nothing there of substance. Yeah, so um, I can't argue with that. Um, I'm probably somebody who tends to feel that 20 or 30 years from now, the whole January 6th thing is going to be viewed as less of a big deal than it is right now. I feel like a lot of people are making it out to be one of the worst things that's ever happened in this country. And I think there's a lot of political motivation for that. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of political motivation by people on the other side to try and act like it was no big deal at all, which is also not true. Um, I don't want to say too much about it, but I, I think as time goes on, it's going to become less and less of a big deal in the history books. Joe Biden. While the withdrawal from Afghanistan was a disaster, that would have probably been a disaster no matter who was in charge. Therefore, I don't agree that that would have been a It was going to be bad. I mean, at some point we were going to have to do it. And I don't necessarily blame Biden for doing it. I'm not sure it would have been just as bad no matter who was in charge. Or I'm going with his forcing private companies with 100 or more employees to enforce a vaccine mandate. It eventually Agreed. got struck down by the Supreme 100%. Court, as it should have been in my opinion. But hey, Biden's still in office. I'm sure if he tries hard enough, he can make an even bigger mistake. And there you have it, every president's biggest mistake. And I should stress, these are my opinions. Sometimes I make mistakes. In fact, if you think I made a mistake about these mistakes, do not be mistaken. Please comment below your mistakes. Hopefully it was not a mistake to make this video. <laughs> well, uh, I would highly recommend you check out, Matt did a stream last night, uh, I think it was with History Dose, where they talked about in particular, like this video getting demonetized and, and age restricted. And, and my friend JD at the History Underground has been dealing with the same issue with his current series uh, from Germany, which is phenomenal, by the way. And I highly recommend you check it out if you haven't already. Great, great stuff. He's exploring some of the roots uh, of National Socialism in the 1920s and 30s. He's exploring concentration camps and all these words I'm saying are probably demonetizing this video. And that's something that Matt was talking about. And, and I have to say, um, you know, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I like Matt personally very much. He and I have very differing views on some things, but we're both educated people that I feel like have principles. Uh, and, and above all things, uh, I think he's just a great guy and he's very supportive of me doing these reactions and that means a lot to me as well. So definitely check out his channel and so, and much more of his content. I'd encourage you to check it out. And I know many of you already have. He's got over 700,000 subscribers. So a lot of people are supporting him, him and it's great to see the growth of his channel. It's well deserved. All right, we're going to drop out right here. I'll throw up some links to some other videos if you want to check out, including uh, the playlist for all of my content related to American presidents. There's a lot of videos on that. So check it out. Thanks for watching.